Welcome everyone to another episode of the Wood from the Trees podcast. I really appreciate every single one of you. And if you want to support the podcast and you like what we're doing, if you could support us on Patreon, we'd really appreciate it. And not only that, but you'll get loads of extra content. You get to join the party, you get to dictate what way it goes, and you could win some prizes. So enjoy the show and I fucking love you. So join us on patreon.com forward slash the wood from the trees. And for the price of a small little cheap coffee or a pint, you get all that shit. So don't hesitate. Get to it. Get to it. Well, um, Shane, thanks a million for coming. No bother at all. Thanks Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. For all the way from Australia. It's great to get the message. I was like, oh, no way. He is getting me on a podcast. This is class. I was messaging you the other day and you were out fishing with the brothers. Yeah, yeah. Just, that was great. I haven't done it for 10 years. No fishing out in Australia? I had to be out pier fishing and you go on a boat if you want to, but you just never, never really got around to it. So the brother said to me, uh, what do you want to do tomorrow? I said, fuck it. Do you know what? I want to get a couple of fishing rods off someone and we just go down to the canal just to have an easy fucking day because... Yeah. It's been hectic now for the last week since I've been home. I've been driving here, there and everywhere, seeing everyone and everyone wanting to see me. And I just wanted a day where... Do nothing. Do nothing. Did you catch was, anything? Oh, maybe 20. But Did you? They were no, no bigger now than a, a you, small you'd Mickey. you only peg you know? them to a penguin. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shane, where are you from? Offaly. Dangan. Dangan. Yeah. Born and reared. Born and reared, Big yeah. family. Uh, f- five of us, yeah. Three brothers and a sister. Yeah, and then... I've got a clatter of nieces and nephews there. Yeah. A couple I've only met since uh, coming home, which is weird. Uh, strange enough, yeah. Family and they're, has got bigger while you were and away. And they're um, tall enough now too. Five years disappears, like where kids did, grow up. And where did you fall in the family? Second. Second from yeah, the top, top or the bottom? Top, yeah. So loads of people looking up to you. Mm-hmm. That's my big brother Shane. <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> Uncle Shane and yeah. Oh, it's class. Yeah. Do you like so, school? Did I like school? Yeah. School was all right. Um, secondary school, like in a stepped away a little bit and acted out a little bit but I left school when I was in fifth year uh, just going into sixth year and um, just wasn't just didn't was, feel it yeah just wasn't really thinking it was going to be for me because I never wanted to go off to college or anything like that did I, you have an idea what you wanted to do were you into it was always I was always kind of working on farms and stuff in about the place my best friend Tommy his dad has a farm and I'd spend you know summers down there with them lads just you didn't grow up in a farm? No, no, no. I grew up in the town there and they just lived out the road. And from the age of like 12. Loved the farm. 13, I was just up in the farm, out in the bog with those lads driving tractors and machines and stuff. And that's where I kind of fell in love with driving the diggers. Yeah. And then I went beyond to um, London then when I was 19. And that's where I really got kind of What going. What made you go out there? Uh, just couldn't get a decent, a decent old job. Like, you know, you'd be doing bits and pieces with the farmers, but... It wouldn't be enough to line the pockets, like, you know. Yeah. That was a big old move. To oh, lad, such a culture shock. Yeah, at 19, just to... Did you know someone out there? No, the thing is, I was with a girl uh, from from the town there, well, just outside the town, and her father used to work for Murphy's, the Green Murphy there, and he drove crawler cranes. And they were actually looking for an apprentice crane driver over in London. Yeah. And he said to me, would okay. you be interested in doing that? And I said, absolutely. I, I idolized that man and he's dead and gone now the last two years, which is sad, but um, I idolized that man and I, I wanted to be like quite him. like him, you know? Yeah. So I said, absolutely. I go over and do it and went over, went for an interview and that was grand. And Had you drove anything? Just, just uh, like on the bog, just like yeah, yeah. moving machines around on the bog, using like, Rough yokes. Oh, trying to get gear. <laughs> rough yokes. No floors on the fucking things. There's yeah. nothing. One wrong step and you could be wrapped Dead. around the drive shaft or something. And, yeah. you know, but um, yeah, I went out there and they wanted to put me on a digger first just to get me used to, you know, tracking a machine a little bit smaller and that. And I just, I loved driving the digger and mm. I was getting really good at it really quick. And What were you on first? I started out on a 13 ton Hitachi, oh, yeah. which I think is ideal yoke to learn how to drive. Yeah. You know, because if you learn a small yoke, they're, they're like, they're grand, like they're jittery and bouncy and stuff like that. It kind of puts people off trying to jump into like a 30 ton or a 40 mm. ton digger. And if you get into a really big one, it puts anyone off moving down into a smaller. 13 tons, just a lovely yeah. little size. I think they're, they're, I never, I don't really have much digger driving done, but I'd say because they're light. Yeah, it just, and what her limits are. Yeah, dead centre in the middle and it's just, it's great, yeah, yeah. So um fell in love with that and I was getting quite good at it. So they asked me 
if I prefer to just stay on as a digger driver as opposed to becoming a crane, crane driver. And I've actually I hung around with some of the crane driving lads and I just felt that they were a little bit lonely and a little bit weary Born. because you're sat there, you, you might do a lift a day, you know, but you still have to be oh. dialed in, you know. Yeah. And I had wear on you, you see them, they're all lonely and cranky and, and they're just antisocial in a sense, you know, and I was just like, fuck, I don't want that, yeah. you know, I don't want that. So I just stuck with the diggers and yeah, ever since. And what kind of work was it over there? Uh, civil work, you know, civil. just, yeah. On the side of the roads or in building sites? Uh, there was one job I was on for a long time. It was a sewage treatment plant. They were like upgrading it, demolishing the old stuff and just putting in new stuff. So essentially we were just putting in like cable conduits and all that kind of stuff. And were you living in the sea? I lived a few different spots. I lived when I first went over because of uh, your one's father, his brother actually knew loads of people in pockets of London, but he himself wasn't over there. Like I was just converging with someone back here in Ireland because I had a few hiccups starting out where people didn't know me, mm. were happy enough to put me up. And then when they were having a shitty day or something, they'd like throw me stuff out on the street and just say, don't want you here anymore. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That yeah, yeah, a few times. That must be horrible. Oh, lad, it was awful. Because I, I, I was in Murphy's yard actually uh, doing something in an office, some kind of a course I had to do or an induction I had to do. And I ended up getting a phone call from the woman I was staying with, son. He was living like... 10 or 12 houses up from her. And he rang me and he's like, oh, I'm just ringing you to let you know that mum's, uh, she's having a shit day and she's after throwing your stuff outside on the street. She says you're not to go back there. I was like, what? And it pouring rain. Like, I was like, no way. He said, yeah, yeah. I said, right, okay. So I had to go and chat to the boss, Dave. And I said, look, lad, I have to go. I said, no, it's a pain in the hole. But I have to go because the person I'm living with is after fucking all my stuff out <laughs> in the street. And sure as anything, I got there and my suitcase, she didn't even... She didn't even put the stuff in the case. Fuck, clothes never. Just, just clothes, just literally just folded it over and whatever fell out, fell out. Just threw it out over because she had like a wheelchair ramp because she was an old, weary old woman. But she had this ramp and she just tossed it over the ramp out onto the ground. Everything just loose and just... So what you do? I had to ring your man in and he had to try and organise something else. So I'm there with me case and everything else that I have just hanging around, walking around places, waiting for a phone call to come back because he's making phone calls back there and... She could be dry, he could be walking around for four or five hours before he gets back. Did you feel like going home? Oh, lad. The first, the first day I was, I actually cried in King's Cross Station because I was just so scared. I didn't know what the fuck to do. Because I walked up the escalator and I remember just seeing this mass of people and just thinking, geez, like, what have I done here? So I went um, to get on the bus. I knew where I had to get off and he told me what bus number to get. So I saw that on the, the live kind of timetable thing. And went to get on this bus. I had no idea that she couldn't pay with money. You have to use a special tap on, tap off card. I wouldn't know that either. I hadn't got a clue. So I saw this bus coming and I ran up to it and I stepped up and uh, I said to the driver, I need to go to Bow Road. And uh, he says, okay. So I went to hand him money. And straight up he just went, no, no, don't take that. Get off, please. Because they don't, they can't be idle. They can't wait because they're on such a strict mm. timetable, the buses. Fuck Any off. delay at all, get the fuck out, you know. So I'm like, what's going on? Like, what did I do? Fuck's sake, I'm standing on the street going, what do I do? What do I do? So I've got loads of people walking towards me and I'm thinking, I'm from Dangan. Like if someone walks with me in the street <laughs> and goes, here, can you, can you give us a hand there? Or, or what, what do I do here? You'd help. You'd help them. Yeah. Oh, fuck not over there, lad. You're, you're, you're stealing from them or you're, you're wanting drug money or something like that. No one out of all the people for ages would help me. So I'm thinking, what the fuck do I do? Like, I don't want to sleep on the street over here. Where the fuck do I go? How the fuck do I get on a bus? What age were you? 19. 19. Yeah. And a fresh 19. Just a twig of a thing. Yeah. And I remember walking back in to the actual um, the actual train station and standing in the door and I just started crying. Thinking, fuck, how do I get back? Because I couldn't go back because I only had a one-way ticket as well. Because mm. I, I had the 100 euros I got for the social welfare at the time. And I signed off. And 50 of that was to get me on the ferry over to Hollyhead and then from the train... Down. Fuck me, that was brave. Oh, lad, lad, I just bit the bullet. Were you just sick of it at home? Oh, just, I was a miserable, depressed fucker. And I'd say if I didn't, I either would have taken the drink or worse. I could have ended up in this guy. You know, it was just, I yeah. was all oh, depressed, you know. So I remember crying in this doorway. And this woman, a godsend, she came up to me and she said, are you okay? I said, look, I need help. I said, I'm not asking for any money or anything like that. 
I said, I just don't know what to do. I said, I'm trying to get a bus. But when I got on the bus, the driver told me to get off the bus because I gave him money and he said he doesn't take money. I said, I don't know what to do. So she walked me over to like the ticket machine, tapped on this Oyster card option and said, give me five pound, put it into the machine and I'll pop this little blue credit card thing. And then she said, put money on that. And that's how you get, get on and off the bus. All it took was just someone just to... One, just to, that little bit of advice was just so hard. I, I was walking around for ages trying to get someone. As soon as you say, sorry, they're, they're, they're gone. They run. It's like you're stealing and you're just this junkie. They're like, no, no, I'm not interested. It's like, that must have been tough. Oh, lad. Rough as fuck, hey. <laughs> so, so what did you but do But it fucking, it'll grow you like. It'll grow you for sure. And then... But you have no choice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what I said to the mother. I was just talking about it there yesterday. We were sitting around chatting and... You know, because it'll be 10 years this year now since I've been gone, you know. And we were chatting about it and I said, Jesus, you know, going to going to England that time, just as hard as it was starting out, it fucking grew me. Best thing I ever did, the best thing to happen to me, to be in that situation where you're like, great, it's fight or flight. Mm. And I was about to go choose flight, but I just stuck it out, you know. And even that night, the woman that I was supposed to stay with actually changed her mind. So I got to Bo Road. And your man rang me and he's like, oh, I changed the plan. I was like, okay. He said, I, uh, she's no longer got a room available for you. I need to try and organize you something else. Now, this was half the end when I came out of King's Cross Station at night, you know. So by the time I got to Bow Road after this whole episode, it would have been close to 11 o'clock. Are you worrying how you're going to get to work next morning? No, see, I hadn't start. I wasn't going to be starting the job until, this was a Friday. I wasn't to be starting yeah. the job until yeah. the following week, which was grand, you know. But even then... You know, you, you don't know what's what's next, where you're going to be staying. I didn't even know the next woman that I was going to be staying with. I'd never met her. She was like a 85-year-old woman, like, you know, and she actually hadn't got a room for me. I had to sleep on, like, uh, couch cushions that she'd laid out on the ground in the sitting room. And I could only stay there for a couple of days because her daughters would have been, say, your age, like, yeah. her daughters would have been your age, and they were, like, weary of this no. young fella <laughs> just sleeping on the so floor. How and, long did it take you to get... Oh, I can relax. I have my own little place and I'm happy enough at work. You know, the money's coming and... Once once I kind of got working, it was grand. But for a long time, I lived with kind of rough people just because your man knew them. Hmm. You know, I'd say I was there. You weren't picking your own crowd. They were being picked for you. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of just stay with them for a while and then a while led to a little bit longer, you know, and then... I'd say I was there for about nine months just with odd people. And then I just went, feck it. I'm going to find my own place. And I then went to live with, um, there was this Bangladeshi man that was renting out his house to like flat share type thing, house share, four or five people in a house. And, you know, there might be a room where there's four Romanians all in the one room. Mm. And then upstairs there might be an Italian fella. And in the other room there could be a fella from, Slovakia or somewhere and then myself and that was grand and then obviously uh, towards the end then I kind of settled in more with the girlfriend where she was living which was grand too but I'd say for about nine months there I was in with rough people where you're kind of on edge and you're in rough areas too like I was in South London like around Charlton and Woolwich which yeah. are notorious for like drugs and you know rough rough spots and turned out the fella that I was actually living with was heavy on the gear towards the end of me stay too. He'd kind of lock himself away in the sitting room and Lord. you'd see him and he, every time you'd see him, he'd be all edgy and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, what's wrong with you? And next thing, what kind of made me go, do you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to do something for myself here. I'm not fucking putting up a George anymore. He kind of cornered me a bit in the hallway and he kind of went, I need more money for rent. I was like, what? I need you to pay me more money for rent. I was like, okay, how much do you want? I need a lot more than you're paying me. I was like, I'm not paying you a lot more than that. I said, I'm already paying like 120 a week to you just for that little room, like, you know? I said, I can't pay you much more than that. And he says, what can you pay me? I said, I'll give you 130 if you want. No, that's not enough. I need 170. I'm like, nah, I'm not giving you 170, lad. And he's like, well, do you know what then? You're just going to need to find your own place. Get your own stuff. Get the fuck out. I was like, no problem. And I did. I just went, fuck it. It, it was easy, you know, having people like that. Because I'd come home. Sometimes he'd even, when he wasn't like, spiraling off out of control with the mm. drugs and that. I'd come home and he'd have dinner made for me and effort. So it was kind of nice in that sense. Yeah. And it was someone to talk to when he was a little bit more sane, but towards the end I was just like, fuck it. You're a big boy now, Shane. Time to... 
And how were you traveling around? The, the trains and the buses, they're, they're actually fucking phenomenal. The transport over there is second to none. Just perfect. So if you were a young lad going out there, you could actually work and get around. Oh, 100%. I, I, there was no need for me to, to drive a car in London at all. Unless, obviously, the company was to give you a loan of a van or something. That would be ideal. But to have your own car in London, I think you'd be mental. Because like, you, know, mm. you pay the congestion charge going into the city as well. So where I was working, I was, or where I was living, I was down the south side, and then I was working up on, in the northern suburbs or, or northern area like uh, Kentish Town and all those places. So if you were driving, you'd have to either go around the fucking congestion charge yeah. or go through it and pay £11 a day, you know. Next Whereas, time you're in London, you'd be playing a big gig yeah, and driving a Lambo. A Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the congestion charge won't matter. Fuck <laughs> it's all covered. <laughs> so how long did you stay there? Uh, two years. Two years? Yeah. And two. were you loving the digger? Loving working yeah, on sites? Yeah, loved it. I loved did you it. stay on 13 or did you move up? Uh, you kind of move up and down. Yeah, there was quite a bit of the small stuff as well, like uh, five tons and three tons stuff. Depending on what we were doing, like, you know, like if you were doing a bit of demo work there, they'd throw you on a 21 ton digger or 30 ton digger or something like that. Were but you using the clamp thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, I'm, the old I have dinosaur. a horn for all Yeah, there. the old dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. I actually drove on in Australia. I'd say about six years ago, I was down, uh, we did fly in, fly out for a little bit, uh, but it wasn't like the mines ran. It was just like working away, doing demo work. And we were down in this small rural town, demolishing an old base hospital. And I was on a big uh, 30 ton Volvo. There was only like seven hours on it. Lovely machine. Really? Lovely machine. Brand new. And they put the old dinosaur grab on it and they said, oh, the news are coming today no to, to make noise about all this Stuff being taken down, they want to put it on the television and all this kind of stuff. And they had me sitting there. Is it on it? Is it on line or anything? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Beyond seven news or something, if it was like, but I don't know how you'd find it, like a long time ago. If it can be found, we will find yeah. it. And we'll, we'll put it up here. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it's going to be, if we can find it. If I can't find it, me and Matt, I am just holding up thin air. <laughs> but yeah, they had me. Um, Sitting there just before we could we started work, like opening and closing the grab, and then they were on the news. The news article was like, all these men have rolled in with uh, modern day dinosaurs to to pull down yeah. this hospital. <laughs> were you used to it? Was so, I like? Is, does it take a bit of getting used to doing demolition work? Do you know? What? I have this vision of if I was to do it, I'd just pull down everything top me. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Like when I first started doing it, I thought this is going to be mighty crack. Like this is going to be great. Just going in just pulling stuff down. But there's a lot involved. Like, you, there's a lot of waiting and, yeah. you know, certain permits and certain things have to happen. And I mean, you you're only, from the top down all the time. Yeah, you try your best to, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to pull, you can only pull in a certain spot and then pull in a certain spot and pull in a certain spot just to, because you want it to fall in on itself mm. as much as you can. And it, it was very slow and very kind of... Tedious. Yeah, this is not fucking as good crack. The, the best crack of it now was like driving like bobcats and diggers inside in big buildings, like doing the soft strip. So what you do is you go through and you you punch through all the walls. like Tokyo Drift. Dun, yeah. dun, dun, you dun. just fly through and break in through a wall and then yeah. you gather it all up and then you just like push it out a window or push it out the main door or something and then machine on the outside with a rotating grab will just pick through it and sort it. And once all that's done, then the long reach will come in and start using the, the pincher on top, mulcher on top and just start picking the, the windows out and then eventually just start folding the walls in on top. Till eventually he just folds it up like a piece of paper, essentially. Is a lot of that work been taken over by Brocks now and stuff? Do you know them? They're like radio control stuff. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of stuff like that. A lot of civil stuff as well has gone. Um, our tunnel work as well has gone all um, radio control. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, Do you know, seemingly them little yorks and they could be only five ton, have more oil pressure than a 25 ton digger. Oh, be good. I'm, now, if that's a lie, it's not a lie of mine. Yeah, yeah, right. That's okay. what I'm after here. Yeah, okay. could, it was probably a hey, but, but lad's going to mess me now. You're a fucking eagle, <laughs> buddy. It's not. But that's what I'm after here. Yeah, yeah. So okay. how long were you in London before you went? Did you go straight to Australia from there? Yeah, uh, we came home here for three weeks just to say goodbye to the mammy and that. And yeah, straight out. Yeah. With the woman? Yeah. Yeah, I met her on Tinder there and I was, I was we were together for about nearly a year and a half over in London, you know, so. But you met over in London? Yeah, yeah. You're she, chilling out in London, you're working. You're working She's away. a teacher, isn't she? Uh, she was. In London? Yeah, 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 she was in London. She's now like a guidance counsellor and stuff like that, so. Mm. Yeah. No wonder your life's playing it. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> come home every evening and it's not most men would be used to their woman telling them what to yeah. do when they come home. <laughs> 
<laughs> but what did you just go? Fuck it. Will we go to Australia? Or did someone say, "Oh, there's good money to be out there"? Or you see, that's where she's. Out? That's where she's from. Yeah. You know. So. Uh, oh, it was just her going home. Really. Yeah, her visa was running out. You know, because what they'll do is the Australians, they want to see Europe, so they'll use London as their base. So they'll go over. They'll stop in Europe for on a two-year visa, and they'll work for six weeks, and then go and see places for a week, and then six weeks see places for a week, and that's how they travel around Europe. Hmm. They leave their base in London, and then after the two years, they could go off to Canada or they could head on home. And so she was wanting to come home, and I was like, "Fuck it!" Like, like so. a year and a half, essentially together. Let's see if we can make a go of it over there. And she said, "Sure." I just assumed that was the the plan anyway. Hop into the bag, she yeah, yeah. Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's how it all kind of started there, and then just straight out. It was grand. I didn't have to do any regional work or anything like what that. What does that mean? Regional. Over in Australia, because you have to do. When you're going out first, you get a working holiday visa, which is a 417, and that's for 12 months. And you have to do, if you want an extra year, 88 days of regional work, which means the work, you have to be working in an area under a particular postcode. Oh. And you can be signed off then as contrib contributing to regional service. And then they'll grant you your uh, second year visa. Is that basically just a fancy way of keeping an eye on you? Make sure you don't go mad and stay there forever. I think disappear. it possibly is. Possibly is, yeah. Yeah, there's so many different... It's it's quite hard to, to stay in Australia, like as someone that's just going out there on their own, just hoping to keep jumping on visa to visa to visa. It's quite hard to do that. A lot of people just end up doing two or three years and then have to come home because you run out of visas. You know, if you're there for like four or five years, you can apply for permanent residency, which is what I've got, but... Not everyone's got that luxury. And with the work on holiday visa, I believe you can, it was the case, you can only work for someone for six months and then you have to move on and work for someone else, which is tough because you'd be happy. Somewhere. You could land your, your fucking dream job out there and you could only be working for them for six months and then you have to move off. Mm. But if you're, I suppose if you're close enough to them, you could say, here, after I get me second year visa or I, you know, get myself sorted, I'll come back and work with you. But did you like it out there when you went out? Yeah, love it. Because I went out there uh, be 10 years ago as well. I went out for a wedding over in Port. And as soon as I landed, I loved it. Mind you, as soon as I landed, the first shop I went into, there was like a, an incident with a, <laughs> involving a knife. Well, you didn't howl up a shop with no, a knife, did you? No, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't walk in, give me like yeah, a fucking money, I was, bitch. I was witness to it. Yeah, wild stuff, hey. Like, uh, kind of like a shop, like... Tesco's extra or something, just like a small grocery store type thing. And there was a few of us there went in to get like shower gels and stuff for the house and a little bit of food, cereal for the morning and that. And just standing there and putting the stuff up on the till. And there was a till working behind us as well. Now over in Australia, <clears throat> over in Australia, uh, kids will work in the shop. Now not small kids, but like 14, 15, 16, 17, mm -hmm. like during the summer holidays. You'll, you'll find a lot of them working in the shops. And behind us, there was a girl working and all I could hear from behind me was, give me the fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of went, fuck, surely I didn't hear that. And give me the fucking money. So the two of us that was standing beside each other, there was a few of us there, but two of us turned around and here was this fella with like dark tights up over his head, shouting at this girl as he was banging on the counter, give me the fucking money. And this girl was terrified, like she was like 14 or something. So she starts hoofing all this money out onto the fucking top of the till. And next thing, the woman that owned the shop, because they're independent owners, mm. you know, she was well up in the years, like she was about 70, 80, a brittle woman. And she walks right over and slams the till shut. Get the fuck out of here. And, you know, and he's like, I'm not fucking around. Give me the fucking money. She's like, get the fuck out of here. Next thing, he pulls out a machete, like one you'd buy in the mad section in Aldi. You know, when mm. they've got the skiing gear in that hand. He pulls this thing out, slams it down on the counter. I'm not fucking around. Someone's going to get hurt. Give me the fucking money. And there was an old man behind him, about the same age as the woman that was owning the shop. And he was after being, because you, you can't buy drink in the shops, like in like Tesco's. So you, there's a lot, usually an off license beside them. So your man had two glass bottles of cider. And he stood behind your man. And he just reacted to this. And he came up behind your man and the back of the head, he hit him with this glass bottle of cider, smashed it, 
knocked your man for six. Your man stumbled out into like where the they bag up all the the stuff and made a run for the door. But they they locked the door. <laughs> they, they they turned off the automatic door and kept you ain't going nowhere and kept him there. So the the four of us that was there decided we try and make a move to grab this fella. And so next thing he started making a run for us, swinging this knife, just like a maniac. I'll fucking kill you, I'll fucking kill you, get the fuck out of here, get the fuck away from me. And I just went, here, open the door, just let him go, just let him go. And she opened the door and he went off and he tried it again down the road in a different shop and he ended up getting caught by the, the cops. But that was the very first shop. Welcome was, to Australia. The very, very first shop I was in in Australia. I was like, God, what the fuck have I come to? But after that, it was grand. Like I loved it, the, the weather, the lifestyle, you know, the beaches and, you know, it is great. You do work hard out there. Mind you, social media does pretend like Australia is the answer to your problems. Mm. But you do you do work hard. Like sometimes you could be between jobs and you could be two or three weeks before you find a job. And when you're not working out in Australia, it's a fucking pricey spot, you know. But it's a pricey everywhere. <clears throat> like if you go out to the small towns and outside the big cities, is it just as expensive? Not, not so much, no. No, the work it, wouldn't be there. There wouldn't be an, a great demand for work, no. Uh, like drinking in, drinking and smoking is heavily taxed in Australia. Heavily, heavily taxed. Like a pint in Australia would be like fifteen dollars. You know. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm off. Uh, like if you go to town and buy a drink yourself in the shop. Um, say a bottle of water could be. Uh, could be three dollars, three or four dollars, depending on where you go, which is not bad. You know, there's certain things that kind of are cheaper you know like I noticed the price of diesel and stuff here is like 170 euros mm. it, it'd be the same over there in dollars so it's near half the price like you know or whatever it is since you <clears throat> came home obviously you talk to your brothers every week and you're chatting to everyone and you see the way our country's gone yeah and how expensive it is yeah. not to own a car run a car have a house insurance yeah. get yeah. a mortgage mm. and then the wages yeah. Like, would you think now talking to them, like, I could never have my life here? 100%. Everyone says this to me, anytime I've, because I was out last night as well, I was actually late one now last night getting in, be nearly four o'clock when I got in this morning. Yeah. But um, everyone asked me when they see me, would you ever move back here? I said, no. I said, I couldn't have, have it the way I have it if I was living here, you know. It's so terrible. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't have it. I couldn't possibly be in the position I am in now if I had stayed here or if I moved back here. You know. It's it's one of the most common things I get told by followers of mine out mm. in New Zealand, Australia, and yeah. America. They 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 want to come back. They want to raise their kids here. Yeah, but they could not you, have the you lifestyle. Can't. No, you would have to sacrifice the the luxuries and the the freedoms and the. Do you know what I got told by someone out in New Zealand, and maybe you'd be the same? They think that kids are allowed to be kids out in Australia yeah. more so than they are here. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, my young fella, I, I find we say. Uh, kids here it's a lot of the times they're like in front of the screens and stuff like that I don't know whether that's just because it's easier for people to do that when kids are tricky or whatever but my young flip outside outside loves it you know because it's, it's the weather it's the lifestyle you can go for all the stuff to do you can go for a walk the parks for kids to play in are world class like you know where do you live now uh, we're you're in, after moving now yeah we're in Brisbane so we're in like a, a northern suburb there called Aspley and it's, we just moved there a week before I flew back here. Is it a renting system out there or buy-in? Do people rent more or buy more? People, uh, see, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Um, houses now are expensive to buy out there for sure. And um, there is still, the, there's a renting crisis out there too. And there's a shortage of houses as well. I think it's all over the fucking world. Mm, somehow, it's all over the world. Somehow it's all over but the how, world. How far do you, are you working in the one place a long time? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> how long are you working there? Uh, I'm with your man now, be over four years. You drive a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything, yeah. Yeah, and it'll be throughout the day. Like, I'll move from loader to digger. If there's a dozer there or a little bobcat or whatever, you know, just moxie, you know, whatever needs doing. Is it true that when you go to Australia, this is not what people tell me, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you're better off working for an Australian company 100%. than an Irish company because the Irish lads dog you. 100%. Uh, dog you. They fucking whip you. I don't know what it is. We were just talking about this um, the other day. We were at a big Sunday session there and we're a few lads that were out in Australia that have come back and they were asking me who I work for and I was telling them, ah, he's fucking dead sound. Like, my boss is the type of lad. I, I say it to everyone that comes working for us because he's very open to allowing, you know, another great thing about Australia is 
it allows girls to do things that girls would not be let do here, mm. like driving, loading shovels, moxies, diggers, stuff like that. There's so many girls that have got potential to be very good on a construction site. But over here, I've noticed a lot of people are just like, nah, you can do traffic control or, you know, you mm. can work in the office or you can do the cleaning or whatever. It's very, it still has that uh, stereotype of a woman not belonging on a site for some reason. Whereas over there, that freedom is still there. But I always tell people about the fella that we work for. You could set his house on fire and tell him you did it. And the two of you will stand out in front of the house looking at it burning. <laughs> and he'll say, well, that's not good eye. And then the next morning he'll ask you to come into work. Like, he's just, I've seen people come and go from there that have wrecked machines. And he's all about, like, he has no gear. He usually buys quite good gear and he's not skimpy on the machines that he buys. And I've seen people come in there talking about being this, that and the other and they've wrecked his machines, you know, and he's never batted an eyelid for some reason. How many hours a week do you work? I used to do a ridiculous amount of hours. I used to be like up to 80 or 90 hours a week there, you know, but now I won't do any more than 45. If you a long drive to work? No, uh, no more than half an hour, maybe 40 minutes going home with traffic, but no more than half an hour, usually. Usually. Are vehicles expensive? To buy? Yeah. Well, I've got a, I've got a, a pickup type Ute thing or Jeep, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. yeah, that was 40 grand when I bought it brand new of their dollars, which I don't think is too you, bad. You wouldn't buy fucking anything yeah. brand new for 40,000 here. I don't think that's too bad. No, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. And tax insurance, like See, you have to tax anything. You pay what's called rego, which is essentially like a tax. But see, the thing about the red is, there's a great thing about Australia, is there's a lot of the stupid expenses that you have here Done. don't exist. So when you buy your Jeep, yeah, you went in, you bought your Jeep, it's 40,000, and then you have to insure it. How much to insure it? You don't actually have to insure it because the red the tax you pay, has got compulsory third-party insurance on it. So essentially, you're third-party covered once the car is red And okay. the red for my York, it's like a 2.5 turbo diesel thing. It's like $800 a year. Wow. So all I pay is $800 a year for the rego. But I mine is fully insured because it's brand new. I hmm. made sure of all that. But once you pay the rego, you're automatically covering everyone else on the road. So there's no, and there's no like NCT, bring it in every two years and let's tell you that it's a shy joke so you'll bring it back in. There's, hmm. there's so many of that stupid stuff, like even the safe pass. There's none of that shy. You literally go in or you can do it online. You pay $40, $50 and it's called a white card. Online course or you can do it in a premises. And it's tick and flick. If you pass it, they send you out a little card. You have that for life. There's no expiry on it. You don't have to go in or renew it or fuck all. The, for some reason, this country has all these little gimmicks and little... Mm. We get we got we 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 got to a stage where we're so choked up on red tape that we can't yeah, do yeah, anything. Yeah, there's all these little fucking things you have to do things you have to jump over and stuff like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Do you, um, what's the schools like? Like, is it hard to get the kids into schools and... We're only, um, we're only getting the young fella into a school now in January, starting primary school in January. And um, a lot of private schools, which are obviously, some could be expensive, some mightn't be. Um, it With just loads depends. Of options, though. Yeah, it just depends on the suburb you go to as well. Some of the state schools could be nearly better than the private schools in a particular area. And, but there's loads of them. And the schools are huge, man. Absolutely. I went in to get a... But you're in a city. Yeah. Oh, fucking huge, man. I've seen some schools in around Dublin and that, but these schools, I went in to get an enrollment form. Holy fuck. I didn't think I'd ever get out of it. I was like, fuck, this thing is its own fucking country nearly. Wow. Yeah, it's fucking great. And are you based there because your woman's family is around there? Yeah. So she's an only child. And she's only got hen. <laughs> <laughs> a laying hen. She, yeah, she's the only child, and um, she's only got her mother as well. Her father died when she was two, so um, yeah, she always wants to be close to her mm. her mammy. Even when she was over in London, it was hard on her. And um, yeah, that's why we kind of stick around Brisbane. There, we're only really ten or fifteen minutes from where her mother is as well, so it's quite good. Would you ever think of uh, moving outside? Brisbane or moving to a different part of Australia do you ever think about that no. it's like you know you're you're settled now you're happy mm -hmm. yeah yeah no I because I I visited parts of Australia Melbourne Melbourne's good but I don't think I'd live there and in Sydney I definitely wouldn't it's just 
too reminiscent of London. You know, too busy. Everyone is go, go, go. But the amount of Irish people in Sydney would blow your mind just in the last 12 months alone. Is your social network mostly Irish or Australian? Uh, mostly Irish. It's actually more, there's more Americans than there is Australian that follow me and stuff like that. Really? Which is very surprising, yeah. Yeah. They're close, like, but there's, there's We're more. We're going to go back a bit. Go way back. Go way back. There's a Phil Carly told me today. Way back. <laughs> um, how did you get into music or when did you get into singing? And uh, The mammy will tell you, like, before I started talking, I was singing, you know, and I was always very good for some reason at memorizing a song in a short space of time. Like, it doesn't take me many listens to know every word of a song and it stays with me. It's fucking strange. I could have a streak of autism myself, you know, the way my mind works. Because I can do the stuff with the changing the lyrics and that, mm. like, real rapid yeah. as well. It's fucking bizarre. But um, there was a time where we used to do the Irish dancing in school, national school. A fella, Mr. Gilroy, would come in and he'd come in at about nine o'clock in the morning until like 12 and he'd do like a half an hour set with first till six class. And one particular day, now he would, I it would I would have been, yeah, I would have been in first class, but we would have had a good few dances done at this stage. It wasn't like the first day or anything. And we we're all just after finishing doing a set and we're sitting on the, on the chairs, sweltering, you know, panting like dogs after being jumping around on the floor trying to dance. And he turns around as he's just, you know, playing with his uh, accordion. Can anyone sing? And no one, no one moved like. And he says, ah, come on, surely someone can sing a song. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a tall fella at all. I was the smallest lad in the, in the school for a while, you know. And um, for some reason, I got up and I didn't just stand where I was. I walked out into the middle of the floor because everyone was like sat mm. in a U shape as I was facing him. He was on the very end and everyone just kind of followed around in the chairs. And I stood right up in centre, turned myself to face him. And he was like, oh, he said, can you sing? I just went, yeah. <laughs> he said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, okay, sing us a song there. Now, I don't know what he was expecting me to sing, but it wasn't the song that I chose. What did you choose? choose? Do you know the song, uh, Declan Ernie's version of Goodbye Johnny Deer? No, what is it? It's essentially, the story, it's mad too, when you think about it. The story of it is a young lad that leaves his, his mammy to go working in America. And that's the first song that you sang? My mother said to me, because I used to do that fucking every Friday for ages, man. And I never told the mammy. I never went home and said, oh, I sang a song in school today. You know, it was only she was in the local shop getting milk or bread or something. And one of the lads that was in sixth class at the time, Jesus Roshi and your young fella's a great singer. She's like, what are you want about? Sure, Jesus, every Friday he does be in singing because your man would keep me in the, in the hall with him. And this is in primary school? Primary school. So where are you hearing this music? Was your mother into... Just, yeah, just in the car or just about, because my mother listened to like Midlands 103 and stuff like that in, in the kitchen of a Sunday there. She listened to Sean Cuddy. I don't know. She could do. You bet her. She she could do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she'd just like have CDs and stuff like that. And your man told her about me singing the song and she came home and she fucking at me. She's like, you little bollocks, yeah. Now you, sing, let me hear you. You're singing in the fucking school, you fucker. I was like, ah, yeah, sure. Just on Friday with Mr. Gilray. He keep me the entire time, the three hours. I just sit with him. And then at the end of every session, I get up and I'd sing the song. And um, she said, what song do you sing? I said, goodbye, Johnny dear. She's like, you do not. I said, yeah. She said, right, sing it so. So I sang it in the kitchen. She said, how the fuck do you know that song? She said, I only got that CD. How do you, <laughs> yeah. how do you know that song? And for some reason, that song, out of all the songs that she's ever played around me, Stuck was you. the one that resonated with me. And I was ballsy enough as a fucking, no bigger than the cup, essentially, to get up and sing it in front of the, the school, essentially, you know. And did you stay doing stuff like that? And then I was involved in... The, the musical society in the town as well and drama and stuff like that which would sometimes clash with football and stuff you know but you rathered I, I was I, lo I liked the both and I used to do a bit of boxing as well like you know so but I much preferred being on the stage doing stuff you know and um, can you remember the first time you were on stage and sang in front of a crowd yeah it would have been in the in the, the local town hall where I've just done a gig there last Saturday which was nice start out on that stage and then come home as the digger dad to do it again. And lovely feeling. But yeah, just always kind of gravitate towards it. I was always kind of naturally able to 
the whole tune for some reason and just loved it, you know. You shared a video, I can't remember when, but you were, I think you were in London learning how to play the guitar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a while ago. Yeah. Isn't yeah, that's a long time ago. Because you were only a bull of a chap. Oh, jazz. You looked fair young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you were uh, there. Trying to learn. The, you were yeah, trying to learn yeah, how to play the guitar. Yeah, yeah. And when you went over to Australia, uh, were you always like at home playing? Like you weren't gigging out in Australia no, or doing anything. Like no, that. I'm only starting to do it now. Like your first, I started getting sent your videos when you started you changed the words of some song. Yeah, And it yeah. went kind of viral. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There was a few of them. Uh, Dangan Style was one. Uh, I completely fucked around with that Gangnam Style song. and. But that was just as a laugh you put that up, was it? Just, just, literally just... On TikTok? Yeah, literally just, fuck it, I need to do something here now. And... How long ago was that? Uh, just that video would be about a year ago. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Maybe a bit more. I think it actually showed up in the little TikTok memory box only recently. This day last year or whatever it is. So when you put up that video and that went viral. Yeah. And then you started putting up a few videos where you were changing the songs and yokes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what what changes in your head when you go, fuck, this is after a lightning spark where I, I actually think this is for me and not driving. I Yeah, see, that's the thing. I, I Or was it a, a really natural progression? Yeah, it was just kind of a... You kind of see see it happening, and you're you're reading the comments, and you're reading the messages. It's and a confidence you, thing, and people are people are saying stuff to you that you yourself don't actually see. They're like, "Goodness me, lad, you're a born entertainer, or whatever it is. You're changing so many people's lives with what you're doing. Fair play to you. I watched the video of you making a cup of tea yesterday, and it lit a fire inside me. You know, just like little videos like that, where you're like, "How has that done something for you?" But just over time. As these things roll in and all these comments roll in and all these lovely messages you get, you kind of think to yourself, do you know what? I've actually got, probably got more to offer than just being a fucking digger driver, yeah. you know? And that's essentially the aim now, just try and move up the ladder in this gigging and stuff. And What was your, like, can you remember a, a moment going home and going, I think, I think I, I have a, a career in this and leaving that behind it's a it's a you as a, a father yeah yeah you know and when you have a, a wife and you have bills you know it's a it's a scary thing yeah, you go yeah. will I no it's what I want to do yeah yeah or you know because social media is weird yeah it is because you never know you never know where it's going to go you never know where it's going to go I'd say that this has been an eye opener for you yeah coming home absolutely absolutely I've so many people rallying to try and get me to go in and chat to them and I've recently become an ambassador for uh Counseling service in Tullamore there. Mm. They reached out and went to their premises to have a look at that to make sure that I was happy enough to kind of put my name to that. And absolutely, you know, kind of counseling service, walk in, call in. If you're struggling or whatever, they're called um, ACT. And they're in Tullamore there. And then there was, um, I got a video sent to me on my WhatsApp uh, recently. It was uh, from the, the special uh, needs centre in Tullamore as well. And they made this video. They knew I was coming home and, there's loads of them in there that are on the TikTok and they watch the videos and they loved it. And they made this video of them pretending to sing and play the guitar and stuff like that. And they're like, please come and see us in Tullamore. And so I went to see them on, not yesterday, the day before. And I wasn't expecting a whole lot when I went in there. Like I just thought I was going to go in there and just stand and uh, take some photos and shake some hands and, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of laughs. Uh, like the red carpet, man. It was the, the whole place all done up for me all these bunting and awfully flags and everything everywhere, a big poster on the wall, welcome digger died. And Is it weird to come home, to leave obscure and come home yeah. and everyone Yeah, yeah, it's strange. Wanting a piece of you. It's strange because I was in Mullingar, a lovely little moment yesterday in Mullingar. I met up with Feelsy because myself and Feelsy are doing some gigs, not this mm. weekend, but next weekend. And um, I was stood with the mother and my brother's missus came with us as well. He was looking after the young lads. She wanted to fucking break from them all. So she came for the drive and we were stood at the lights there near Pennies and Mullingar about to cross off the road. And there was a woman with her two kids. One was in a pram and the young fellow was standing holding her hand. And all you hear is, that's the digger. <laughs> <laughs> and just stuff like that. It's just, it's a lovely feeling. Yeah. Lovely feeling. And, you know, you see them go all shy and timid and they're not sure what to do because they're starstruck. And it's like, 
I was just like you one day, lad. I'm just a little bit taller, you know, and just a lovely feeling. What know? does your wife think of it all? She's she's fine with it now. At the start, when things first started taking off, she was kind of like, Are you sure you want this? Like, you know, because this is hectic. Like she, she herself, she doesn't want to be um, part of the whole video stuff, mm. which is fair enough. You know, she's in a particular kind of a job and all this kind of stuff. And um, so I'm always kind of cautious of that and how far to take certain things as well. And always kind of checking in with her to make sure she's doing all right with all this stuff. Because the one video that did kind of freak me out a little bit was um, the Fast Car song, where I sang that in the, the Jeep, hmm. half four in the morning, that took off like wildfire, just went everywhere in such a sort of short space of time. Hmm. And it, it was near frightening, like, you know, because it, it consumes you then. All of a sudden you've got millions and millions and millions of people watching you and you've got all these different messages from people over in America and all these women offering all sorts of favours and propositions Mm. No matter the marital status and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, for a while I was consumed with the social media and just checking everything, just making sure to be able to reply to every comment and every message. And yeah. it took over me fucking life, man. And there was one time where we were out having lunch. I'll never forget it. And it actually woke me up to say, social media is not reality. Mm. Take the time to do it. What was it? We were having lunch and uh, the mother-in-law said she'd take the young fella for myself and the wife to have a bit of lunch yeah. and unknowns to myself the entire time we were having lunch I was on the hooding phone I never once took the phone away from my hand I was constantly on the phone even when the food was in front of me which I never did never did and then I didn't understand there and then why the missus was fucking take with me heading back to the car I said what's wrong with you nothing and she storming down the road like I said, I said what's wrong nothing and then we got into the car and she said, you were on your phone the entire fucking time we were there. And I was like, no, I wasn't. She said, you fucking were. I said, no, I wasn't. I didn't even realize. And then it was only thinking back now, 100% the entire time. And I was just like, fuck it. I need to separate myself from this a little bit and just remember it who's important. When you're not used to it, it takes a while to figure out that, you know, you have to separate it. Yeah. It becomes a job. Yeah. But if you, I think we're lucky because you're older. Mm. Do you know, because you can learn quick yeah. and you will have people yeah. around you that'll say, hey, yeah. you fucking stop. <laughs> yeah, and you're fucking else. fun. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're 15, 16 and you don't, you don't listen to fucking anyone mm. and no one's going to care whether you're staring into a, fuck you up, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then being that age as well, they all want to be the mm. social media giants because that's all they're seeing. So if they can consume their lives. See, it's human nature. Yeah. You know, it's human nature. We all, like deep down, more than money, more than that, we all want to feel yeah. important. Yeah. Everyone wants to be special. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. But when you're living in, like what I do say, the real world, yeah. it's yeah. very hard to feel yeah. special yeah. when everyone's looking for money and absolutely. you have bills to pay and absolutely. kids want you to take yeah. training. And yeah, it, it's, there, there's no, it's not perfect. There's no dreams and nothing just all of a sudden everything is handed to you. You're still having to, Mm. Get up in the morning, go to work. What's, if I could say you have your dream life next year, what is a typical week for Shane? Dream life, I would like to be doing something like this, podcasts and stuff during the week and doing venues, playing shows on the weekend. What was it like coming home and going out and doing that gig? The one in Tullamore yeah. was fucking hectic. Were you nervous? Uh, you know what? Everyone's asked me that because people said to me, when you got up on the stage, lad, you, the confidence was like unbelievable. See, the thing is, I'm backstage pacing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pacing. Because you look very chilled. Yeah, freaking out. And see what I was doing. It wasn't captured on the video, but the fella was on before me, Thomas Fay, a local man in Dangan as well. Shout out to Thomas. Thomas Fay, good man. Um, he was on before me and the fellow that was running the Phoenix came up and said, it's 10 o'clock, do you want to go on now? Or I said, yeah, let's fucking, let's do it. Like, you know, so Thomas just kept going until I was close enough to the stage. And while he was halfway through his song, I just kind of, for myself more than anyone else, just kind of did a little bit of messing where I kind of poked my head out and stood up on the stage and just kind of went and then ran away again just to kind of yeah. see Ease what the crowd, see what the crowd were doing, you know, and they went mental, so I did it a couple of times just to mm. build myself up. And then sure, as soon as I stood up on the stage then, 
I was at ease. But before that, I'm up there freaking out, like on the guitar and I'm trying to play this a certain song. And Did you have a set list? Yeah, yeah. Couldn't couldn't get the fingers right on this particular song. I was like, oh, I'm going to make fucking balls of this up there now. But once you're up there and you, the nerves going to settle, everything just kind of falls back into place. It's great, great fucking night. Some crowd. Do you play gigs now in Australia much? I haven't actually. I haven't done much of it at all, to be honest. I, the only ones I really did was with Feelsy there. You in, know, after this now, you're going to find yeah. it very hard to not. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I want. That's what I want. But see, I wanted to do it properly too. I didn't want to just be one of these uh, pub singers, you know, that just goes into a place of a Friday or a Saturday night and you're essentially just background noise. You know, there might be people that are enjoying you and stuff like that, but when you're in a pub, you're essentially just background noise, which is not what I want. I want people in the place that have come to see me, you know, because it, it has that special kind of a feeling. It feels great mm. knowing that there's a room full of people there for you. that have come to see just you and they never take their eyes off you the entire time you're up there. It's such a fucking feeling. Even the mother said, like, she, she's beaming, like, bursting my pride since I came home and seeing all this stuff going on. Like she said, when she was in Tullamore watching me on the stage, she just said, fuck me. She said, I don't know what you were feeling up there. She said, but for me to see everyone in that room there for my young fella. Yeah. Just, she said, there's no better feeling, you know. So this, that's, a, that's a lovely thing. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're gone and you're lonely and you miss home. Everyone yeah. misses home. Oh, absolutely. You know, people, the thing with social media as well, is people automatically assume things, you know, before... Like, they only listen to a couple of words of a video. And they're automatically assuming that you're something that you're not. Or they you get know? triggered at the first sentence. Yeah, and then they're yeah. Like, There's a certain word, regardless of what follows it, hmm. that pisses them off. You know, the race the races gets turned, thrown around a lot of the time too, even though you wouldn't be saying that bad about anybody. You know, you just talk about, you know, everyone needs help and all this kind of stuff, you know, whatever it is. But, um, um, yeah, the problem with social media is people just assume you're a certain thing when you're not. So people assume that I hate Ireland because I've left it. I don't hate the country. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I don't. That's a ridiculous thing. I, I don't hate the people. Not at all. It's just where I've gone to, it works out better for me. That's all it is. But people, because you're not here fighting for Ireland, as they say, that you automatically don't like the country. Well, I'm, I'm here and I feel Ireland's fighting me. Yeah. That's yeah. the vibe I get. Yeah, I feel like I that. am here doing God's work in the devil's playground, yeah. but by God, the devil's with it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have said that. And but I, I tie it, me and Vicky, every month, maybe once or twice a month, we have a conversation going, I think we should go. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think we should go, go somewhere. Cause where I'm just where not, would you go? I, anywhere. See, uh, do you know the way your dream is to, you know, play music? I mm. fucking love machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd, I'd love to drive stuff. I love driving. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather do less driving. Yeah, okay. Like, like this week I have 60 hours done in the cab and home today. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'm fucking wrecked. <laughs> you know yourself. Elbows. Yeah, yeah. Your arse. Yeah. Back would be fucking broke. Yeah, yeah. I just like to do less. I just, I just feel like you're getting road here. Everyone's getting road here. Yeah, yeah. And everyone that I talk to from a different country says the same thing, you mm. know. They'd, of course they'd rather be home there. Of course they'd rather have their Oh, you'd love home. to be close to the mammy there. But if you can't support your family and be at home. And be happy. And be happy. Yeah. And happy means spending some time yeah. at home. You know, yeah. you, 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 you live to, you don't live to work, you no, work to live. Absolutely. absolutely. And it's very difficult. And that's the, going back to the uh, Irish worker or the Irish boss in Australia, they don't, they don't have that attitude of um, you work to live. It's you work out here mm. and we will make sure you work out here. For some reason, Irish people, when they own a company or they're forming out in Australia, they've got this vendetta against their own. Like It's like they're doing you a favor by giving you a job. Mm. So you just fucking, whatever he says there's goes. A, there's a lot of people though have um, this thing where they've had no money and they just, they want to succeed mm. and they sacrifice everything yeah, to get. Yeah. They don't have... A dislike for anyone. They just yeah. that's their work ethic. Yeah. Like I've I've worked for people that you could have seventy hours done if you go home early on a Saturday to go, You're not going for another load. Yeah, yeah. Fuck's yeah. sake. You yeah. spat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it too. Some people yeah. are just like yeah. that. Yeah. They've literally removed themselves from a social situation to build this thing and that's all they know. Mm. That's all they know. And Oh, your brother's proud of you. I I assume so. Yeah. 
Did it not? Did it ever go? Hey, Shane, you get off that fucking TikTok, you yeah. fucking eagle. Uh, the, 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 the younger brother, who's a year younger than me, he's a woeful messer with it. You'll see him there, like if I do a live or something, you'll see him pop in on the bottom of it there, just fucking, just mouthing off. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just That's saying, brothers do. For fuck's sake, you're never off the fucking phone. Or mm. if he sees a video of me sat in the load or, you know, just talking a bit of shite or singing a song or something, he'll say, Jez, would you ever do a bit of fucking work? Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did they all work at? Uh, he himself, he works for Heatways in Tullamore. So he essentially does deliveries and stuff hmm. up and down to Dublin. And he could go to Limerick, he could go to Donegal, you know, it just depends. And I've got an older brother that's not doing a whole lot. Um, he's got a whole class of children as well, like, you know, hmm. so. How uh, have you not got them all out there with you? How have they not went out to Australia? They had uh, kids early enough too. And it's tricky, like, yeah. it's very tricky. A lot of people have said to me, since I've come home, do you reckon it's good to move out there with a family? And it's like, it might be, but you could move out there and hate it and you've thrown all this money at it. You know, it's more of a dip your toe in the water when you can, when you've got no tie downs, hmm. see if it's for you and then start a life out there. Whereas if you've not been out there before, some people have just bitten the bullet and gone and it's working out really well for them. But if you've not done it before and you're going to essentially pick everything up, move it away, move away from Mammy and everyone else that's here, throw so much money because you can't just go on a work on holiday visa when you've got kids. You have to go on a special family mm. visa which costs thousands of dollars and you know, you can't flat share. When you've got kids, you have to re go rent your own house which is expensive too and you know, there's a lot involved. But um, yeah, it's just having the, the kids and that would have kind of limited what they could do as opposed to like leaving Ireland. Like, the younger brother there, the youngest of, this, of us, he's 19 now. He's in town and he's doing like a course where he's getting some kind of a qualification in uh, woodwork, which is like cabinet making it, hmm. and um, engineering, some kind of an engineering He'd thing on the side too. He's money in a few years. And he, his agenda apparently is Australia. Once he has all this kind of done, his agenda is Australia. So we'll see. What's your typical day? Typical so day. You, what time do you get up at? Depending if I'm working, I'll be up up for work. See, with me, I have to get up and I have to be up for a while before I leave because if I, I'm not one of these people that can get up and I'm just go. Because I forget stuff. I'll forget to bring stuff. I remember I was halfway down the motorway and I hadn't even put on my fucking work trousers. <laughs> I stepped out into the garage and jumped into the Jeep and I was driving. In your boxers? In the boxers, lad. I was... I woke up late. I had like 10 or 15 minutes to fucking... I suppose I'm not thinking about the heat. If you don't let yeah. in Ireland now, you get yeah, some yeah. land when you walk outside the, the door. The, the garage is attached to the house. So you literally just step from the kitchen into the garage and yeah. the, no temperature change at all. Like, you know, so you just jump in and I looked down and I was like, fucking hell. So I had, to, I had to turn back around and drive home. So I have to give myself about an hour, you know, waking up. So I'll wake up at like three, three in the morning. It depends on if I'm going to go to the gym that day too. I could get up at half two. Do like 45 That's minutes. That's the middle of the night, lad. I know. I know. But I, they, they reckon, they reckon um, the millionaire mindset is up uh, early in the morning. Before four oh, o'clock. We're all fucking dying with dementia and fucking be, in, in 20 years. Be, be, before four o'clock in the morning, they reckon is the millionaire mindset. is where your, your genius comes into play or something. Oh, I get up at that time and I'm not a millionaire yet. <laughs> And I'm getting up a long time now. I don't know where my fucking million euros are. <laughs> but yeah, then I'll just tip off to work and I'll work 12 hours and come home then and have the have the dinner. Um, watch. So I, 12 hours, 40 something hours. So you, only, you work four days, yeah? Yeah, I only work. It's worked out now uh, where we only work, some of us only work a seven day fortnight. Which That's is cool. fuck great. It's great. And it's a roster. You know, you rotate. You might do three days, two days off. Three nights, two days off, two days, three days off, you know. When you come home, what do you do? Uh, depending on how the young fella's behaving, we could be just playing with him until dinner time or if he's looking for dinner straight away, we'll just have dinner and then do some playing with him, watch a little bit of TV. He has like half an hour to an hour of his cartoons of an evening. Mm. That's about as much screen time as he'll have. And then it'll be pushing on to like half seven where it's essentially bath and bedtime for him because with his autism he's in hmm. routine and stuff and yeah I'll do I mainly do bath time um, and then dress him after the bath and he has a little cuddle on our bed with us and then into the room and I'll read him his story and 
he goes off to bed and then myself and the wife, we'll either watch something on the telly or we could watch something on the iPad in bed or we could just be on our own phones. Just, she does all the work emails and stuff as well when she's at home. Or Do you keep an eye on what's going on at home? In... Ireland. News. Not particularly, no. Just whatever pops up on the old um, TikTok and that. Yeah, not particularly. I don't... I kind of tried to... I'm in this mindset now where I kind of separate myself from nose and stuff because the nose just tries to, to poison you. Yeah. That's what it's designed to do, to keep you where you are. And if you can separate yourself from that, you'd be surprised where your mind can go and then where you end up. You know, that's, that's I feel, what's happened with me. You know, I've kind of separated myself from all the negative stuff that you'd see going on in social media and in the real world and all this kind of stuff and started to dream mm. in my own head and essentially start to believe these dreams and then yeah isn't it funny that back if someone had said to you 10 years ago you know oh if you dream it uh, it might happen yeah you go fucking yeah idiot. yeah but literally like if you don't think it and if you don't manifest it and then go for it yeah nothing happens no absolutely everything everything you see in this room was a thought yeah someone thought of that now it might not work yeah but it's surely not gonna yeah. work if you don't try yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah. if you can think it and you can see it it can surely happen mm. you know but when the opportunity presents itself, you have to make it happen. It's not going to happen for you. It's like with the gigs, you know. The opportunities came to me, I took them. You know, if I didn't take them, I'd be no further. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's just one of those things, you know. What do you hate most about Australia? Not the spiders now. I know the spiders. I wouldn't like that myself. Um, probably the distance from from home. You know, it is, it's a long way, you know. Um, you do go through regardless how long you're out there doesn't matter and anywhere in the world like Canada be the same America be the same you go through bouts where you fucking get this just heavy hit of homesickness because I'd love to be at home I'd love to be at home I'd love to be at home and it's just that flight in itself is 24 hours long like you know fucking long 14 hours from Brisbane to Dubai and then 8 hours from there to or 7 hours or something from there to Dublin like you know that's a long time to be in the sky. So you kind of, you don't want to do it too often and it's expensive as well. So it's, you know, it's probably the distance I'd say. The people are great. I love the Australian people. They're just next level mad. Like just mental cases. Do not give a fuck, man. They do not care. Everton is just a, a joke and Everton is great crack. Mm. You can have some crack with lads on site. Like just unreal. And the bosses, like I said, they're just so fucking laid back. They, they want the work done, like, but there's no panic. No what panic. What kind of work do you actually do? What is it? Uh, right now, well, for the last while, I've been just working in like a, a cement plant place. So essentially we, um, and it's on the port. Yeah, like are you, are you mixing the cement? Like, like, like I just, I just put, into, shovel, I just put it into, into hoppers and yeah. And then they it goes through the plant and all that kind of stuff. And then if a ship comes in with, say, like material on it, it'll discharge in where we are and then we just, stack it up in like a big pyramid, you know, or a big like prism, just huge stockpiles and stuff like that. But everything, see, think the reason I can do what I can do with the videos is you know, on my job, I couldn't do it on like a civil job or something like that, is a lot of my stuff is on times. Hmm. So I have to do this at a certain time, this at a certain time, <coughs> this at a certain time. And once I get those few things done, I've got a break before I have to go and do it again. You know, so within that break, y you could easily put together yeah, five or ten you videos. You have people going, oh, he's getting no work done. Yeah. You're <laughs> Absolutely. I, I do. I, I used to find that so funny. You know, you're doing a 12 hour day and you have a, a three minute video. That's what I said. That's what I do say to him. I said, was this video 12, 12 hours long, lad? I know. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of it's all just timing. And so like most, some of my videos are banked as well. I've already got them hmm. there on the side. So that if I do have a hectic day where if I have to go off and push up fertilizer, which is busy, like that's that that sometimes can be twelve hours nonstop, you know, because you've got trucks, say, coming from here to the other side of the building, just back and forth into the shed, just constant, 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 because it's coming off a ship, and the cranes of the ship are constantly feeding this hopper. The trucks have to be constantly moving. You have to be constantly pushing because if you're not pushing, the loads get ahead of you, and you'll never get it high enough, and then you'll never fill the shed enough, and people start giving out in, you know. So there's days where it's like really busy. And you've got these videos on the side where you can just keep yourself on the algorithm or whatever, even though I don't fucking follow that stuff. I don't even know how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> how do you think you'll feel when you're driving up to Dublin to go home? 
I'm actually, I'm already looking forward to it. But at the same time, it's going to be, it's always hard. You know, the, the mammy, she does be broken every time I go. Is your you father know? still alive? Yeah, yeah. I don't too much chat with him at all. Don't get on? No, no, no. Does he ever see your videos and stuff? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We, um, we haven't, we haven't spoken now for a long time. I haven't spoken for a long time. I do notice that my aunties and uncles on his side do watch the videos. So whether they say it to him or show them to him or I'm, I'm not sure. No idea. I'm sure he has. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think about them too much now. These mm. are just questions that I ask everyone. Yeah, okay. Right. What's your first vivid childhood memory? Oh, God. Probably doing the singing in the in the school with your man. Do you ever talk to that lad? Mr. Gilroy? Hmm. If I look up there and ask him how he's getting on, possibly, yeah. yeah. He's passed, is he? Yeah, he was an old man at the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he was the catalyst. Yeah, yeah. He Isn't was that the, funny in yeah, life? Yeah. The people that make an impact on you. A hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, he and was the one And it could be that, just the littlest, yeah. littlest moment. It's like that woman that gave you the directions in, yeah. in London. Save, fuck, save me, yeah, for sure. Who knows where I would have, if I would have went home or... Just Where like a show like we should all try and be nice. Yeah, that little that's smile, it. that little that's are you okay. It. Yeah, could that's just it. help someone. Absolutely. So much. Absolutely, you don't know what anyone's going through. You know, on the outside, the everything could look fine, but deep down, like you know, you just never know. You never know, and just that little hello or how's it going? They all nodded the head or something. Hmm. Just be enough for someone to just go. You know, I'm grand. Yeah, I'm grand. You know. Yeah. Would you like yourself if you met yourself? I think I would now. Years ago, I wouldn't. Before I left, I wouldn't. No. Oh, I was an insufferable bastard. You wouldn't be around me at all. Why? I felt like everyone was against me. The world was on my shoulders. Why me? Why me? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? I was a completely different lad before I took the move to go to England. Just, I was smoking heavy. I was drinking heavy and, you know, just wasn't, wasn't in a good spot. I bet now, because <clears throat> I, I watch your videos. Mm. I do see you doing little videos. And you're secretly giving young lads advice because you've been that guy. Yeah, yeah. And if you were to say there's young lads listening to this, and it's very easy for young men, especially, to get nihilistic, to get upset with life yeah. and think that the mm. world's again, because mm. we need goals yeah. and we need to do stuff. What advice would you give them? I, I wrote that song that over that Ed Sheeran fucking music, mm. there's a reason you're here type thing, Suicide Awareness song. And essentially the name of that song is the advice I give you. There's a reason you're here. You know, my days were hard. My days were dark. But I stuck it out. I changed my way of thinking. I stopped worrying about what other people have and what I haven't got. Mm. Focus on what I have got. Be yeah. grateful for what I have got. Be thankful. Openly say every day, thank you for my wife. Thank you for my son. Thank you for my life, whatever it is. And suddenly things start to change. Tend to the parts you, you of start the garden finding, you can touch. You start finding your reason for being here. And it's life changing, man. Life changing. So like, if you're in a spot, don't give up. You know, just keep pushing. Something good will come. Exactly. Who brings you the most happiness in your life? Uh, my wife and my son. But my young fella. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is his hero. You know, loves his dad. And just great feeling. Great feeling being a dad, just waking up in the morning. And just even hearing him when you come in in the evening from work. Dad, you know, it's just magic. Isn't it? Unbelievable. Just magic. Absolutely. Yeah. I miss him something shocking. Hey, I'm only home a week, you know. I know. Can't wait to get back over to him. He Is asked it? me, he asked me yesterday, Dad, you come home tomorrow? I'm like, oh, uh -huh. won't be tomorrow, lad. It'll be a few more days, but. Does he get, has he any concept of, you know, the videos and when you'd see the videos, you're in a place playing a gig and loads of people there. Does he think that's Not cool so, or does he get it? He doesn't really understand it. You know, I did the, uh, La this time last year, I did a thing with the High Kings hmm. when they were over in Australia. Because when he was a baby, we didn't know he had autism until he was like two. When he was a baby, he used to like be really unsettled and he'd be struggling to get him to calm down and stuff like that. The only thing that would calm him down the High Kings. was the High Kings music. Like the Irish pub song, Rocky Road to Dublin. Yeah. All that. The only thing he would settle right down. So when I found out they were coming to Australia, I did this thing where all my followers quickly... Go on a night of hikings, I want to sing a song with them for me young fella and stuff like that. And happened. I, I, it happened and I do show him that video. And that's that video alone, he understands that dad sings with the hikings. But he's got no concept of this TikTok stuff or 
the fact that I'm actually over here playing music or anything like that. Sometimes he can't stand me singing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, stop singing, Dad. <laughs> uh, this is going to be an interesting one for you. Is home for you a place or a feeling? Uh, feeling, feeling. I am I'm at home in two places, you know, absolutely, you know. Did you mind moving to the next house that you moved into? No, no. I actually felt more at home stepping in there than the one that I was originally in. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it was our hard work that got us there. You know, working hard, owning your own house is a great feeling. So when you step in there, you've got that pride, you've got that gratitude. You're like, fuck, this is, we've done this, hmm. you know. So I felt more at home walking in there. And my wife was the same. Couldn't wait to step in there and go, this is where we're at now. The progression of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you walked into a room uh, with everyone you ever knew, dead or alive, who would you go to first? Um, everyone I ever knew. If I if I could separate certain people now, like my wife and son, obviously, just yeah. Yeah. a particular person would be the man that worked for Murphy's and uh, kind of did the crawler kind of stuff. What would you say to him? I I thank him for everything. I didn't. <sighs> he was a an ex girlfriend's father, and just essentially was like my dad. You know, Fair and, figure. yeah. And he'd ring me when I was in London all the time, and he'd ring me when I was out in Australia. And you know, he got sick there, and he essentially um, he faded off fairly fast. And when we'd ring, we'd have a great chat on the phone and stuff like that. And then there was times when he would ring, and I'd just say, "Oh fuck it," you know. I'll ring him tomorrow, or I'll ring him the next mm. day or something, and then you forget. And then since he passed on, you kind of think, fuck. So you could say goodbye to him? He, yeah, he rang me. Um, I remember the last time we chatted on the phone, which is probably why I'm fucking the way I am now. But he rang me and he told me that he was he was scared because he didn't want to, to leave his daughter, of course, and everyone else, the, the grandkids and stuff like that that he's got going on. And then he kind of came to himself because he was always this kind of big, mm. tall, like, rah, you know, kind of a man. And he um, he kind of came to himself and he said, no, I'd be grand, I'd be grand. And he said, I just want you to know I'm very proud of what you're doing. He said, I knew you could do something magic with your life. He said, and keep doing it. He said, I know things didn't work out between you and such and such. He said, and that's okay. That's life. Yeah. That's part of it. He said, but you met me for a reason. And that reason was to put you where you are now and look what you're doing. He said, keep going. He said, you've got stuff to do, keep doing it. And that was the last uh, phone call we had. He knew he was, he knew he was dying and he, he told me he was dying. It speaks volumes that he'd say to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been that open a lot of the time. Um, he'd always, like, he'd refer to me as son, you know, all the time, which is a lovely feeling. And uh, tell me that, you know, I see something in you. You know, there's something in you that you're going to do that's not sort of what typical people about the place are doing, you know. But it's, just that last it's, conversation. It's so important for people to have someone like that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you just never know until they're gone, really, mm. who that person was. As and soon, I think for most people, it, it probably has to be someone outside your family. Yeah. Yeah, you know because you, you, your you family are up, always going to your ah, family are always going to blow kind of either either blow smoke out of your arse or just slag you the fuck. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's only someone that's on the outside that will tell you as it really is mm. whether something is working or something's not working, and you just get that genuineness off them, and then you believe them. You believe them, and I I feel like since his passing and, and everything that he's said to me leading up to that and everything he showed me he was the one that kind of gave me my worth at Eke and yeah. all this kind of stuff kind of steered me and kind of essentially pushed me but in the best way just to, to go for stuff I feel like since he's kind of passed on that I've just taken all of that that he said and just pushing it out there using it as momentum now yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah 100% yeah. I think an awful lot of your videos you've done that yeah you know, you do do an awful lot of videos where you give people advice, especially advice on, hey, look, this isn't fucking easy. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, because yeah. there's a lot of people do go out there thinking, hey, we'll answer all their yeah, problems. But yeah. nothing's going to solve the problem of work ethic yeah, and yeah. having to get down and dirty and yeah. do the thing you don't Absolutely. want to do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, 
What's the most painful thing you've ever been told? Painful thing I've ever been told? They're not easy questions, are they? No. No. I suppose I'd be probably grown up, the, the father tell you that you'd make nothing of yourself, you know, essentially. That, that sort of stuff kind of stays with you. But again, you use it as a kind of a, a means to keep going. It's too high, high octane of fuel though. Yeah. When you hear that from someone. Yeah, yeah. That was, that's essentially, that stuff that stays with me, you know, like you, you'll, you'll never make that in yourself or you're useless or, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I suppose that, that'd be it. Other than that, I can, I can take it. I can take a slagging and I can take someone that I don't know fucking saying whatever they think because what they think is not true, you know. It's, it's irrelevant. But when you've got someone that essentially was to be a, a role model to tell you stuff like, oh, you're useless, you know, you'll be born idle all your life and all that kind of stuff, it, it kind of kind of stays with you a little bit longer. Can you remember a time where you went, I'm just not listening to this anymore? Yeah, oh, yeah I just... As I kind of got on in life and realised that I am fucking doing something with myself, just kind of tune out, you know, yeah. That's essentially why I don't just, I don't deal with that side of stuff anymore. I don't invest in things. Mm. When I hear people, you know, talking shit about other people and, you know, cause there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like, oh, he said this, she just said that. There's a lot of that stuff. When I hear that, I tune out. I don't want that inside my head. I feel like I, I'm healthier in my mind, in my body. And everything when I'm just focused on what I've got. Positive stuff. Mm. Get rid of mm. the negative. Absolutely. How do you define success? Being happy and content in where you are. You know, you could be successful, a successful cleaner. If it is you're happy with everything that's involved. If you're happy with the money you have, the lifestyle you have, your family life. You know, it's there's a difference between rich and wealth. Hmm. Rich is money. Rich is just numbers, cash. Loads of rich people kill themselves. Yeah. Rich is just cash. Whereas wealth is everything. It's essentially just a massive love all in one. Whatever it's money, assets, family, life, job, all that. And when you've got wealth, I believe that's success in hmm. itself, you know. I think it's a little combination of stuff. I do think it's like, am I paying my bills? Yeah. I think once you get your bills paid, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I have them paid. Yeah. <laughs> I worry. That's next month is next future day of his problem. Yeah. But I think if you have a few friends, yeah. you know, as, your, as long as your you're happy with, happy, and, happy with everything that's going you know, on in your life. Why not fill out with you today? Yeah. You know, yeah. you're not having to get in trouble. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then you're, you're not doing too bad. Yeah, that's it. Do you believe in God? I recently have done, have started to, yes. Yes. What has changed? What made you start believing in God? Um, I've been really getting into this uh, manifesto, you know, the power of the mind and stuff like that. And I've kind of read and listened to different books and stuff like that about it. And there has to be, there has to be something, you know, because every, every religious group all the way back through the, through the ages have always had this belief of there's a higher power, can't be killed nor destroyed. It's forever there. Do you talk to him? God. Yeah, just thank all the thanking all the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be driving to work, thanking God for stuff I've got going on. I drove home from Tullamore the other day after leaving the car in there from doing the gig, and I thanked God for the entire night, the whole way home. And I feel like if you do that, you get more things then to be grateful for. If you believe in that sort of stuff, it will. It's kind of like planting more of them seeds yeah, of positivity, that's it. isn't it? That's it. That's it. I really believe because that's that's essentially how I've changed my life and my way of living and the person that I am is just, I'm just more fucking grateful for stuff now. Whereas I'm not like, he's got that, why can't I have that? It's like, I will have that if I want it. You know, I just have to go and get it. You know, not take it off him, but you know what I mean? Can you remember the last time that you felt hopeless? Um, hopeless. Um, do you know what? I don't think I've got a feeling of hopeless, but I remember feeling useless. 
obviously my wife giving birth to my child I felt fucking like <laughs> that's fair fucking, use of fucking you nearly would feel hopeless you know no I don't um, I don't think I've felt hopeless now no that's good how do you handle and process emotions if they're very positive like so uh, I found this with social media <clears throat> the positive comments I think and it's probably I don't look at my comments I don't I post and ghost right yeah yeah <laughs> and uh, I think the positive ones are just as damaging for me oh, okay so I don't look at any comments yeah right okay because I I feel it changes who you are I think if Ooh. you're say what I do is I, I just post stuff this is my day this is what I do mm. and I see with social media if you're looking at the negative right the negative will put you in bad form yeah yeah right but it's just people that don't know you so yeah, it's irrelevant yeah, yeah. but the positive is gonna reinforce stuff that you mightn't be 100% sure on and you're just gonna oh this is getting positivity I'm yeah. gonna do this yeah, I'm yeah. gonna do this and then you're not actually being yourself for yeah, me yeah so I do feel if I I have to sort of separate myself from everything to try and be me yeah, okay. Yeah. So I do try and not buy into all the positivity yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because I don't know why I believe myself. That's why I love doing the podcast. So when I'm talking to you in long form conversation, mm. I, I'm getting to know you, same as if I was talking to you on a, in, a, in a pub. Yeah, yeah. And I get to talk to all these people and you get to see all these different points of view. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I, and I love that. Yeah, right. Whereas if I'm looking at your videos, I've watched your videos. Yeah. But I'm, I'm getting to know you now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, because there's it's more dimensions to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't, I don't do overly investing in the comments myself either. I used to at the start. I used to, but no, not so much anymore. Like when I see a really nice one like that, praises me on how I, you know, communicate with the young fella. It's always nice, nice feeling stuff like that. But like when I'm, when I'm like beaming with mm. positivity and happiness, I just resort to to music like. Just try and use that as... Say it's a great outlet. Yeah, as as like a fuel, you know. Like with, with those funny songs, that's me essentially at the height of mm. feelings, at the top level, going, do you know what? This is fucking, I'm going to do something here now. And you just come up with something and send it out to you and you're like, right. How many songs have you wrote? Have you backlogged songs no, I, in your head? I've never written anything on a piece of paper. Really? Never. In your head, just... In my head, yeah. A lot of those songs that I've come up with those kind of parody songs and even that Suicide Awareness song. So I've always been on the fly, like, when I'm driving the loader, putting gear into the hopper, like, because you'll have the song playing in the, on the speaker and a particular song will come on and I'll be like, God, that is a bop. I haven't heard that for fucking years, you know. And you listen to it and you're fucking going with it and next night you're like, fuck, do you know what? I'm going to look for a karaoke version of this now. And then put music... Play it in the background through this, the Bluetooth as well. And then as it's going, just keep keep with the same kind of melody and then just throw little words and sentences in and all of a sudden you start just creating. You remember it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying at the start there. Just for some reason I've got this... You're like the rain man of music. I've got this like <laughs> knack for remembering songs, even songs that I've just come up with myself. You Are you good at remembering names? Yeah, usually quite good. I think I have to hear it a couple of times. If I'm not... You probably are on the spectrum. I think there's a lot yeah. of people probably on the spectrum but we just don't know it. 100% lad. 100%. It's not It's not a new thing, you know. I have to write everything. Yeah. Me, everything. Yeah. I write me, everything around. It's gone. Yeah. When it comes out, gone. <laughs> me, me nanny was saying this to me. I went out to see her on um, Thursday when I came home or was it Friday? Friday, I think, when I came home. I went out to see her after I was on the radio because I gave her a bit of a show on the radio. She loved it. like And... Um, she was, uh, we were talking about my young fella with his autism and that. And she says to me, she says, isn't it mad? Like all these people nowadays with autism, wouldn't you wonder how that's happened? And I says, it's not new, Nanny. Like, you know, it's always been the case. But the only thing is, is years ago when there was a fella or a young one that was heavily, you know, influenced with autism, like, on the higher of the scale. Probably drugged in a mental institution, probably. And they're just putting a corner in the classroom. He's the bold young fella. You know, because they can't, sometimes they can't control their impulses and stuff. And you you think they're being bold when it's it's not. It's just 
that's their brain and they're not getting the support they need and then it well, just I bet you can remember someone you went to school with that now looking back you can more than 100% one. more say, than one yeah more than one yeah and everyone thought he's fucking he's a lunatic bad. yeah just, he's a crazy yeah, cunt a lunatic yeah 100% lad that's, that's what it was that's the most positive thing, positive thing about society now people aren't left behind like that yeah, anymore yeah it's great and even well, sometimes it's, I think over here it's hard for yeah kids and people to get the diagnosis early you know, people are having to wait a long, long time. And it's very important, I find anyway, with my young fella, to get that early intervention. Like, as early as you can. Because there's some kids that are mute with their autism, that don't speak at all. Now, that is not something that I noticed years ago. That is something that's, for some reason, very common lately. Not sure why. That's just my opinion. I think it's very common in the last 10 or so years or 15 years for, mm. ki for kids to be mute with autism. But um, that early intervention, when a, kid's, when a child's brain is and mind is so open and free to whatever it is you're saying, they're going to be able to, to take in a lot more. They're like sponges, man. They'll mm. just take everything in and whatever you can give them early on, they'll remember and they'll feed off and it'll just, they'll just excel so much it's more. It's the foundation that yeah. they need to build yeah. on. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Uh, when was the last time you shit yourself? The last time I shit myself? God. Just it wasn't, wouldn't be recent now at all. Just I'm trying to think. Fuck, I don't know. No, no heavy night on the beer. You didn't get sick in the machine. Shite all over. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, There's too many people around yeah. the port. I'm just going to shite myself in the can. No. no, God. Oh, no, it would have been like a long time ago. Uh, what's something that you're holding on to that you need to let go of? Um, probably a lot of my upbringing. Just memories of that bad memories of that it's easy for people to say just let it go just leave it stuff stays with you you know and you, you can't just let it go like there's, there's times where I never think about it times where I never ever think about it nothing comes to my mind at all but then there's times where I'll just go into a dip in me mental I let me mind go and I just go into a dip and all of a sudden all this stuff starts resurfacing and I keep trying to tell myself this happened fucking 20 years ago like or 15 years ago, fucking let it go, man. Let it go. But it's, it's trauma and it's like fucked with your mind, you know, for so long that it's just hard to let go. I'd love to be able to just wipe that, those certain memories completely clean. But I think at the same time, it's kind of helped me be who, you are. who I am now and the person I am and the friend I am, the father I am, the man I am. So, you know, there's kind of good and bad with everything. So what would you say to 15-year-old Shane if you met him on the stairs down there? Uh, on the side. 15-year-old Shane. Don't worry too much. Probably don't worry too much because I used to worry about what I was going to do. You know, where I was going to end up. and you know. Why did you worry so much about where you were going to end up? Because I was... I don't come from a, a family of like wealth or success or anything like that. So I didn't want to be, um, like, I didn't want to be on the dole. I didn't want to be, you know, someone that was really struggling with life. And I always worried about growing up, would I be able to get a job? Do I need to go to college? I don't want to go to college, but do I have to go to college in order to get a good job? And, you know, I, I put lots of pressure on myself. Why? I don't know. I just, I was scared of being unsuccessful, I suppose. I always had that ambition of being successful and I kind of worried a little bit about not achieving that and again that's the whole mindset thing when you worry about stuff not happening for you why me why me why me it's a, it's like a, when you were a young lad you were more worried about what you were going to do when you were older than being a young lad yeah 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 because with whatever went on as a child you kind of grew up fast through all those experiences so you kind of you lived out your little bit of childhood that you could and then you had to start thinking right I need to start thinking about later on and yeah, just pressure and stuff like that. And just wanting to be better, wanting to, to, to prove that I could do stuff, prove that I could 
that I wasn't useless, that I was going to be something, you know, just trying to prove to not just other people, but to myself that if it is I want to be successful, I can. And I just put so much pressure on myself as a young fella to, to try and do that. And I probably didn't help myself either by, you know, not kind of taking different leaps and steps and putting myself out there a little bit more work and stuff. I always kind of took safer options with people I knew and not kind of branched out and stuff like that until I took the big plunge to go to London, which is obviously the best thing I ever did. Mm. So I just think everything works out the way it's supposed to in that regard. But yeah, when I was 15, I just was always looking ahead because I was in a group of friends as well who were like farmers and, you know, always kind of they money, money man, money mad, just planning, fucking yeah. taking over the world and stuff like that. And, you know, they got so much knowledge and wisdom and understanding of this, that and the other, the price of cattle, the price of diesel, how you can fucking make money by selling turf and all this kind of stuff, you know. So I I never grew up with that apart from being on the farm working with them. So I wanted to try and be the fella from the town that kind of God. spiraled and just kind of went, oof, you know, success. You know, so I always put pressure on myself as a young fella. So I'd probably tell myself just to relax, you know, stuff's coming, just relax. Yeah. If you can relax and clear your head, then you can focus on the stuff. Whereas when you're stressed, you know, you just, you start falling down, you know, stuff starts getting on top of you. Would you like to have more kids? One more. We've got one more on the way. Oh! Yeah. Christmas baby. Yeah. One more, that's it. I told her. I'm one more? S- I'm swapping the gun. <laughs> I'm replacing it with a cap gun. All the fun, just no consequence. Get neutered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Fuck having any more than Don't two. get neutered. If you D- get neutered, your, your ambition will go to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, one more. Um, Shane, it was great talking to you. Yeah, it's good. Good crack, hey. I love this, hey. Isn't it grand? Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, mighty good. Ho, I have one more question for you. Who's the... Your podcast. Who's the guy... That you create. Oh, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, he's just a little uh, a friend of mine that does work with me every now and again. <laughs> but I, I often wonder when I hear people having a person like that. You know, yeah, yeah. That alter ego. Yeah, it's yeah. It's someone, you know. It's someone that you've laughed at and giggled at. I think we've all come across a fella yeah. on, a, on a site that's just not the full shilling. Mm. Like, you know, that's but just... But it's lovely. Yeah, just the no nicest harm. lad. The nicest lad, but just take his shit. Mm. Just fucking, you never have to bait the lad to pick up a shovel, like, yeah. or to, to use it properly. Or they could say the most outrageous yeah. things. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have one guy that I know that says the most outrageous things. Like, I mean, anyone else get arrested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he, he says it and he, he just told, what was it he said one time? It was fucking horrible. <laughs> it was something about all the people. We were all talking about Jesus, like, I get you do social media, I do social media. The amount of young lads that message you. Yeah, yeah. It's suicidal. Yeah. And, yeah, 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 absolutely. Lad down the road and he was there, he's from Cork. He's there, oh, fucking lad, kill himself. I knew him well. Actually, look, life's not for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and you, what? <laughs> ah, life's not for everyone. Ah, stop. See, yeah, and and there's, yeah. there was no harm in this yeah, lad at yeah, all. Yeah. But now he lives at home on his own and he's a lot of dogs. I don't know what goes yeah, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell, yeah. No, but I think it's just we we all know someone, like yeah. especially in construction. Like, there's always someone that arrives on a job where you're just like, this fella is mental, you know, and just wants to work really hard, but just is this mm. as shit. You're gonna find yeah. it hard to go home now and get back to work and just go back into the normality of it. Yeah, I probably will. Yeah, I reckon I will. It'll be. I don't know either. I don't know either, because I like to be busy. You know, I like to keep moving, but I'm hoping. That's with everything that I've got going on that I can start to really make the pushes to eventually get away from the 12 hour stuff and start doing what I love doing. Like I love driving the diggers. Love it. Been great for the 10 odd years I'm doing it. Like, you know, it's great. But it's not a passion. It used to be. When I first started, I tell you, when I first started, I was addicted to the fucking thing. Huh. I'd go to work, drive the digger, come home from work. And spend the entire evening looking at fellas, drive diggers. <laughs> I know. It's I was a problem. fucking obsessed. The missus would say to me, what is fucking wrong with you? Like, I don't go to fucking teach and then come home and listen to someone else teaching kids. <laughs> do, do you want to hear the irony of it now? Will I tell you something now? If you were to leave all the diggers, just say you were, you had four gigs a week. Yeah. 
and you were gigging like mad. Yeah. Six months and you'd be mad to drive Yeah, be, you'd be missing it again. You'd be missing yeah. it. Yeah, I reckon so. I reckon I, I so. Tried, I've left the forestry. Yeah. And I couldn't. I reckon so. You just miss doing that hand eye yeah. coordination yeah. thing and that time to think. Yeah. I, I think I, I think I would. Yeah. I think because I when would. you're driving stuff like we do every day, you do it automatically yeah. and you get used yeah. to it. Yeah. And you actually have that headspace. Yeah. Where you can just think. Yeah. And you oh, can sing and listen to music. Your, your mind can go wherever you want mm. when you're driving a machine, regardless of what you're doing with it. You could yeah. be digging around pipes and that. You know, I know you're concentrating and stuff, but like you said, it's all subconscious. You know, you're just mm. like driving a car, changing the gears is just you don't ever think about it. So that's that's left your head. So that's freed up a bit of space for you to do whatever you're doing inside in your mind, you know. The free reign of the, the mind when you're inside the machine for 12 hours, just throwing material up. It's fucking... And plus, if you leave, you can't call yourself the digger dad anymore. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's mad. Hey. Maybe just uh, singing that. Yeah, <laughs> it's mad because you've, you've built this fucking name Followed. and this logo and, you know, everything as well. And it's hard to know. It's hard to know. I think you could make a fortune just... Uh, Going to Komatsu and Volvo and launching the digger and the machine and driving it out and then getting out onto the step yeah. and singing a song. <laughs> oh, the Volvo is the best machine. <laughs> 20,000 euro, please. I, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind doing stuff like that, like working with a, a like a big brand like that hmm. as like the digger dad and stuff, doing their social media side of things, tipping out to, to different sites and stuff. I, I think you'd be shit hard. Yeah, I reckon that that'd be a good gig, and then obviously doing the music then on the weekends. Yeah, but keeping the old digger dead. I can see you on a hundred ton digger bucket singing a song. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> mind you, I could probably stand in a forty ton digger bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thanks a million for coming on. No bother at all. It was great. So, Absolutely. And loved when it. you're doing your own podcast, and if I ever get a chance to go out to Australia, I'd love to. Oh, come on. The next time I'm home, I'll be up and going and we'll definitely do it on my end cool yeah cool. 100% thanks a million thank you I'll all the best well what do you think of it yeah it's great that was good it's good crack isn't yeah, it fucking sure that's why it's, it's just chatting yeah yeah that's great there's no pressure there's no fucking